remember when we were little, we used to sing, There's Power in the Blood? Wonder working power in the blood. Would you be free from your burden of sin? There's power in the blood. Power in the blood. Would you a victory? Would you? Huh? Come here, brother. Would you or evil a victory win? There's power in the blood. The blood will never lose its power. That's another great song we've sung many, many times. It reaches to the highest mountain, flows to the lowest valley. The blood that gives me strength from day to day will never lose its power. And as you can see, we have stations here that have bread and juice setting on top of them. The bread representing the body of Christ, the sinless body of our beloved Savior. The juice representing the blood that he shed when he was crucified. Did you hear me? His body and his blood. Those two elements represent our life. We are now his body. This is the body of Christ. He's the head, we're the body. When Jesus was on this earth, he talked about a bread coming down from heaven, and if a man eats this, he will never hunger again. I can testify to that. Ever since I tasted that bread, and in fact, I'm eating it, I've been pretty satisfied. Everything else tastes stale like a mouthful of gravel. But Jesus also talked about his blood, the new covenant in his blood. So what does all this mean? Power in the blood. And if I'm drinking juice or wine or the fruit of the vine, as they call it, what am I doing exactly? What, what is this? I'd like to say, if you don't believe that something's going to happen this morning, when you partake of this, don't waste your time. Don't even take the juice or the bread if you don't believe something miraculous, powerful, and supernatural not can take place, but will take place. If you don't believe that this represents the blood, which will never lose its power, which is able to heal all manner of sickness and disease, which is able to drive back demons, which broke the back of the devil, which overcomes the sin of the world. If you don't believe that you can overcome a habit, an addiction, and walk in power and victory, do not waste your time doing this today. Just sit there and watch the rest of us. Because Jesus did not sit with his disciples that night just to establish a liturgical practice in church. What he was doing was what Jews had done for thousands of years. No telling how many millions of lambs had been roasted for Passover. Or bread had been baked. Tons and tons of bread. And how many gallons. Millions of gallons of this liquid consumed. They did it on the night of the Passover. While they stood, they ate it. He said, don't even sit down. Keep your staff in your hand and eat this lamb and break this bread and drink this wine because this very night the death angel will pass over you because the blood has been applied to the doors of your homes. Folks, that is still going on today, and I believe it with all my heart. I promise you, this preacher is not interested in some type of ceremony. I'm not interested in just going through the motions of religion. 
I want Jesus Christ who is raised from the dead to walk up and down the aisles of this church as we remember him, his blood, and his body. When you come to Isaiah chapter 53, what a great exposition of the crucified Messiah. But more than that, it's, it's an explanation of how he lived. One of the verses says, As a lamb is brought before her shearers and is silent, so he opened not his mouth. Ah, oh, you get a key right there. To the power of the life of Jesus. When he was accused, he did not even defend himself. He would not argue about who he was. And when you come to the New Testament, you see Paul explaining the whole attitude of Jesus and why he had such power. He said, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not think it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, took upon himself the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of man. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore, God has also highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. What he's saying is, the blood has power because when it flowed from his body, it flowed out of a humiliated, broken, humbled body. And if I am to have the power that that blood affords, I've got to walk in the humility of Jesus Christ. I mean, when will I get to the place that I stop defending myself? When will I get to the place that I try to prove to people I am somebody or I am something I am not? When will I get to the place that I don't crave affirmation? When can I just let Jesus be my lawyer? As long as I defend myself, Jesus will not defend me. But when I say I turn it over to him, God will stand up in my defense. I have nothing to prove. That's the brokenness of Jesus, the humility of Jesus. He didn't come down here to prove anything. He came down here to die, shed his blood, give his body so you and I could have reconciliation with God. When Jesus stood in the River Jordan after he was baptized by his cousin, I can just see it now. His, his beard is dripping and his hair is matted and his clothes are clinging. And he just stands there and looks and suddenly this voice from heaven says, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. Do you hear what I'm about to emphasize two or three times? Humility says, I have nothing to prove. Humility says, you can't defeat me. Humility says, the Lord will take care of this. Humility says, I will let them accuse me falsely. I will let them abuse me unjustly. But God will be my defender. My fighting days are over. I humbly submit myself to the Lordship of Jesus Christ, to the hand of Almighty God. And what happened? Immediately the devil took Jesus to the wilderness and attacked him and said, now you don't mind if I paraphrase a bit, do you? If you're the son of God, turn these stones into bread and feed yourself. And Jesus said, I don't have to do that. 
I don't have to do anything to prove I'm the son of God. I don't have to do it for me or them or you to prove that I'm the son of God. When I just got up out of the water, my father said, you are my beloved son. I am pleased with you. Wait. I had not yet performed a miracle. I've not raised a man from the dead. I've not fed 5,000. I haven't done anything. But because I stood there as in humility, my father said, you are my beloved son. So I don't have to turn rocks into bread. I don't have to jump off a building. I don't have to do anything. I am God's son because I have humbled myself under the mighty hand of God. Now, why don't we try that? Why don't we quit trying to prove, yes, even to ourselves that we're saved by all the things we do, by the way we try to kill our bodies. You know, you think if you kill the body, you'll kill the lust and the desire, you won't. I got some news for somebody today. The Bible never says kill your body. It says crucify your flesh but present your body as a living sacrifice to God. This is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Did you know Almighty God's living inside this body right now? So I don't want to kill it. I don't want to destroy the temple. If any man defile the temple of God, him will God destroy. But it's my flesh. Old man Loran. But at that, I don't even have to prove that I'm saved by doing anything extravagant or religious. I shouldn't have to go around and prove to you that I'm saved. Because it doesn't matter what you think. I, you know, oh boy. You just have to bear with me. I got some things coming in here. I got some stuff coming, all right? Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, we stewards, we apostles, considered stewards, have been charged with the responsibility of telling you the truth. And the first requirement of a steward is that he must be found faithful. He says, and by the way, it doesn't matter to me what you think about me. I'm telling you what the Bible just said. He said, whether you think I'm a good steward or not doesn't even matter to me. He, in fact, in fact, he said, I don't even judge myself anymore. I don't even know myself. I don't have a conclusion about myself. I don't even evaluate myself because I don't know who I am. All I know is I'm a new creation in Christ Jesus. I've been raised from the dead with Christ, baptized with Christ, and I'm seated in heaven with Christ, and yet I don't know who I am. I don't know who I am, so I don't judge myself anymore. So he said, what does it matter what you think about me? Because I don't even know what I think about me. He said, don't judge anything before the time, before the day when the Lord will come back, and then he will judge every person from the thoughts and intents of their hearts. But until then, don't judge one another. Just love one another. Quit trying to figure out if he's close to God. Quit trying to figure out if he prays enough. You know, it's amazing. I'm, I'm just getting some stuff here. i got to preach. It's amazing how we'll read the passage about the Pharisee and the tax collector. Jesus said two men went to the temple to pray. One was a publican. The other was a Pharisee. And the publican stood in the corner and smote his breast, beat his chest. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. That's all he said. The Pharisee then looked at him and said, Man, am I, am I glad I'm not like him. <laughs> and so he's condemned for, we condemn him for judging the publican, and we turn right around and judge the Pharisee. All right. All right. All right. I thought somebody would have enjoyed that. But. We do the same thing the Pharisee did by judging the Pharisee. Because we Christians think that it is our responsibility to be fruit inspectors. I know it's good preaching. 
I prayed about this. I know it's good preaching. This is a letter from heaven. And we start judging one another as if we're all in the same season. Well, David may be in his fruit-bearing season, and I may not be in mine. And if Mr. Fruit-Bearer over here looks at Mr. Barron here and says, something ain't right in his life. He, he's not bearing fruit. He, da, 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 da. Then he has just borne rotten fruit. Because God says, leave them alone. Leave each other alone. My God, we're a family. Leave each other alone. Stop beating each other up. Stop judging one another. Just embrace one another and realize we're all messed up and we won't get it right till Jesus comes back and takes us home. You don't know what that person's going through. You don't know why that person did what they did. You don't know why. Because you don't know their heart. Because you don't know your heart. So what is my responsibility? It is to humble myself before God. Humble myself before you and say, I don't really know you. I can't know you, but I can love you. And I can forgive you. And I can have passion or compassion for you. And that's my only responsibility. I'll leave the rest up to God. Huh. Well, but pastor, last week you preached on fighting. Yeah, but folks, a soldier of, of the cross fights on his knees. And he doesn't fight people. He fights darkness and unbelief. He fights on his knees. And he fights with tears in his eyes. And the soldier of the cross is the most violent against darkness when he humbles himself in the sight of the Lord. And I can prove it. Because when you come to the last book in the Bible, especially the fifth chapter of the revelation there's God Almighty sitting on a throne and John does his best to describe him he doesn't he says he's like this and he looks like that but then in the fifth chapter he says in the right hand of him that sat on the throne was a scroll and I heard a loud voice from a mighty angel say who is worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals and he said, no one in heaven, on earth, or under the earth was worthy to take the scroll or to look at it. John said, I began to weep much because no one was worthy to open it or look at it. But then one of the elders stood up and said, don't weep. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seals thereof. Watch this. He said, the lion of the tribe of Judah. But when John looked, he saw a lamb. The lion looked like a lamb. And he looked like he had been crucified and slain. And when he saw him, then all of the elders and the mighty creatures fell down and said, you are worthy because the lamb became the lion because he would not fight. He would not resist. He submitted himself to God. Oh, when you get to heaven, you'll see him as a man. You'll see the nail scars in his hands and you'll see the stripes on his back and the holes in his feet and possibly scars around his forehead. But what you'll really see is the Lamb of God that took away the sin of the world. So, so what is this? What is this? This is what represents the power you can have in your life today. When you humble yourself under the mighty hand of God, God will give you victory over the sins in your life. 
when you humble yourself at his feet, and instead of roaring like a lion, if you'll bow your head like a lamb, God will take you higher, and God will show you glory, and God will give you victory every step you take in your life. Could somebody help me for just a minute? Bless the Lamb of God that has taken away the sin of the world. Hallelujah. Pastor Grant. We want to ask those who will be um, serving us to come forward now to the station. And of course, we're doing this a little bit differently today, so uh, let me give a few instructions. Uh, you see the tables here in the front of the sanctuary. They're also in the other buildings and on the other campuses, and uh, we have tables in the back uh, of the balcony. David's going to lead us in, in, in some worship in the choir. We're going to spend some time just enjoying the presence of the Lord together. And uh, you may want to spend some time in prayer with those around you before you come. We're in, we're in no rush this morning. We're here to enjoy Him. Uh, so as you feel you're ready for the Lord's Supper for communion, we invite you to come to the closest table, you along with uh, your family group. And uh, we'd love for the head of the household to uh, serve that family, a cup for each person in the family. And then if the head of the household would take one piece of bread and um, your family will share that bread together. And we certainly recognize that families look different. Uh, for some, the head of the family will be the father or the husband. Others, it may be a brave single mom. Uh, some of you may be here uh, by yourself today, and we don't want anybody to feel awkward because, as Pastor said, we're all one family. So if you're here by yourself and you would uh, love to celebrate communion with someone else, just uh, join a brother or sister near you or another family and come forward. If you want to be by yourself, that's certainly um, completely fine. So again, take time to pray. We ha have plenty of time. You don't need to, 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 to make a big line. Just enjoy worshiping and, and watch when there's a space to come forward. Um, then after you uh, have your communion, uh, pull aside so that uh, you can come up on the stage or just into a corner or go back to your seat and immediately enjoy a communion with your family. Um, there will not be a formal prayer together with everyone before we celebrate uh, communion. So... Um, we know the Lord's going to bless this time together. So we want to pray, and then we'll begin to worship, and uh, you come and, and celebrate the Lord's Supper as you're, as you're prepared. Heavenly Father, Lord, you are beautiful. We love you, we praise you, and we worship you. Because you did all of this for us. Lord, we cannot even begin to imagine your love. So we pray that you'll bless this meal today, this juice and this bread. And Lord, we know as uh, your children come to this table, uh, we come in many different situations. Lord, I know people will be coming and taking a cup and taking a piece of bread and they find themselves in situations they never would have planned, they never would have chosen, but here they are. And that's why we need you. We cannot do this alone, and we thank you that you've given us your Holy Spirit. You've given us the body of Christ to be together, to love, and to support one another. So, Lord, as we come to this table in whatever situation that we find ourselves in, we know that in your presence, in your communion, there's fullness of joy. So, Lord, may you be our joy today. And, Pastor, so... Uh, amazingly reminded us as well that there is indeed power, Lord. So wherever we find ourselves today, you have the power to finish that good work that you've started. You will never leave us and you will never forsake us. So bless our, our families, bless our singles, Lord, as we come to your table today in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Amen.
Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul, worship His holy name. Sing like never before, O oh my soul, O oh worship. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul, worship His holy name. Sing like never before, O oh my soul, O oh worship. It's time to sing your song again. Whatever may pass and whatever lies before me, let me be singing when the evening comes. Bless the
draws near and my time has come still my soul will sing your praise this place this morning. Lift your hands and just worship Him with everything. For your name, Jesus, be all the glory. They sing like never before. Oh, my soul, I worship your holy name, Lord. Lord, I worship Tell them this morning, Lord, I worship your holy name. Come on, give him praise. We worship your Jesus. Could I just sing one more song? David, I love you, Lord, and I lift my voice. Go ahead. I love you, Lord, and I lift my voice to
go out of this place in the power that is in the blood. Go out of this place knowing that God is in front of you and behind you. On either side of you, above you, below you, and in you. Go out of this place knowing that he has given us the victory in Christ Jesus. No weapon formed against you will ever come to anything. And the gates of hell cannot prevail against the blood of Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Our most important service will be Wednesday night at 6.30. I mean that. See you then. This place will be full. And we're going to touch God again. Have a blessed day.